have some permission to offer some thoughts. Right. That's probably the best way to go about it. So okay. uh, ask permission if you could talk with the, one of the individuals about what's going on. And I, you can say, I'm aware there's some hardship and that concerns me as your dad or your father-in-law or whatever. And um, we, we uh, love you guys and, and we want the best for you, but I don't even know what's going on. Yeah. And I just would, wondered if you would mind if I asked you some questions about what's going on. I'm not going to offer advice. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, um, you know, put anybody down. I'm not going to judge you. I just need to, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on first. Yeah. Would you mind if I, if I ask you some questions? And then see yeah. what they say. They say, okay. Then you can say, well, what's going on? <laughs> but you have to be really careful to listen. Maybe even mirror back. That it means, uh, like, you're, okay. here's how, what I think I'm hearing, and then you mirror that back. And so you're going to get as clear a picture as possible in a supportive environment yeah. um, that you're providing for them. And then you, then you might say, um, uh, let's just say, I'm just making this up because I don't know your circumstance. Let's just say yeah. you're talking to your son who is married to your, your daughter-in-law. So you talk with your son first. and say, you know, I, if it's okay with you, I would like to simply ask your, uh, you know, your wife, my daughter-in-law, similar kind of questions just to find out her perspective. So, you know, if that's all right with you, I'd like to do that. And, and see what they say. You don't want them to feel like you're going behind their back, so you want to be yeah. upfront about this because you're just trying to be a good dad. Yeah. You're not trying to meddle, but you are, you're not an outsider. You're not a stranger. You're dad. Yeah. And even though they're adults, it still doesn't mean that you have no role in their life. It changes, as you know. Yeah. But uh, they'll always be your kids, so this is the thing. <laughs> yeah. That's how that works, you know. Yeah. That's, that's good advice, man. I'll, uh, I'll take that. Yeah, and then maybe you'll learn something about managing the first conversations uh, yeah. with the, you know, by man- to go to the second one. I don't know. But uh, also you want to let them know that um, that you're going to hold whatever they tell you in yeah. uh, confidence yeah. uh, with the possible exception is if you want to include your wife in what you're learning and you think that would be okay with them, then you say, yeah. I'm not going to talk about this to anybody except for your mom. That's it. It's just going to be between us. So right I'm, now she probably knows more than I do. <laughs> say again? <laughs> my wife probably knows more about the situation. Oh, okay. All right. They, they tend to go to mom first, you know. Yeah, okay. Well, my point is is that I think it's appropriate for you as a mom and dad, as a couple, to be yeah. involved in this. And even if she's not there, be be communicating that your communication is private with the exception of mom. Right. If that's okay with them. Yeah. And then take it from there. But the, the, I don't know anything about your personality, Tom. Right. But I know about mine. You know, I jump a little too soon and start talking. And so the I, key... I think I'm more like you. <laughs> okay. Well, the key is, is you want to discipline yourself to, to ask the questions and to listen. Mm-hmm. And and just if if there is an ambiguity, it's okay to ask some more clarification question. No, I'm just trying to understand this. Son, you said this. No, did you mean this? Or did you just mean that? Or help me to see this. Okay, and listen, 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 listen without interrupting. Just listen. And uh, for guys like you and me, apparently that's a little hard to do. Uh, it's not native for us, yeah. but that's going to be key in this spot. Yeah, I think that's sound advice. Thank you, thank you, Greg. Thanks for reading the thing on the uh, uh, COVID nineteen. That's that was good stuff. Oh, okay. Well, Tom, uh, it's my pleasure. And this is kind of crazy. It's just, it's just nutty. Every time you turn around, there's more nuttiness about it. So um, when my wife went to Costco the other day to do some shopping. It was wild. People are stocking up and everything. Why do they need toilet paper anyway? I don't They're get it. Maps out of it or something. <laughs> it doesn't like, like a pack. At, at, at Costco, you get like 12 rolls per package, right? That's yeah. going to last till Christmas, for goodness sake, for most people. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is, <laughs> it's the flu. It's not like, well, anyway, not going into that. Thank you so much yeah. for the call, Tom. <laughs> all right. Good. Uh, okay. All the best. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, uh, let's go take a break a little bit earlier here, then we got more calls coming up on Standard Reason. Would you like Greg, Alan, or Tim to come speak at a location near you? If so, just send a quick email to darcy at str.org to schedule them today. Our speakers are accomplished and compelling presenters who address, from a biblical standpoint, topics like abortion, homosexuality, and evolution, as well as apologetics, theology, and evangelism. They're available to teach lectures and seminars, preach sermons, and lead workshops at single events or weekend-long conferences. Their aim is to help Christians like you effectively engage the culture around you with knowledge, wisdom, and character. To learn more, just go to str.org and click on the training tab at the top of the page. You can take Stand to Reason with you through our mobile apps, available for free from the App Store or the Google Play Store. The Quick Reference app gives you short, easily accessible courses on our most popular topics like tactics, homosexuality in the Bible, morality, the story of reality, and many more. The Stand to Reason app has all our latest content available at your fingertips. You can listen to our podcasts, check the blog, and access timely and practical resources. They're free, so download the apps today on the App Store or the Google Play Store and start carrying Stand to Reason with you everywhere you go. If you enjoy our apps, you can help other people find them by rating them on the App Store or the Google Play Store. Final segment here, Greg Kogel on Stand the Reason. And, uh, well, this is Chad in Louisville, and Chad, uh, looking at the call, excuse me here, I have not had this, this kind of question for a long, long time. Looking forward to it. What's on your mind? Hey, Greg, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. In fact, I'm going to be in Louisville uh, in about a week. A in week from today. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. Uh, um, I'm going to try to make it out there. We'll, we'll see what happens. Okay. Uh, I had a pleasure meeting you up in... Uh, yeah, hey, in August, and you guys, you and your colleagues are great, so I just want to say thank you. You're so welcome. Um, so, yeah, I uh, finished up. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist um, a couple weeks ago, and we were actually discussing the problem of evil, and a couple that I didn't know were King James-only individuals brought up uh, Isaiah 45-7, 
Um, if you want to, I don't know which issue you want to address first. Um, the King James Version only. Your just take on the King James Version only movement. Okay. Um, you want to tackle that one first? That'd be fine. Yeah, let me let me say something about that. Um, there's a couple of really good books on this. It, it, it doesn't it hasn't come up um, for a long time. For a while there, I was getting a lot of calls, but it was a number of years ago. Okay. There are two different um, two different versions of this movement. Okay, mm-hmm. two different species of the King James only crowd. Okay, um, the King James uh, was published like the 1500s, and uh, and it was a translation from Greek and the Latin Vulgate that Jerome was responsible for into the vernacular of the time, that is, in the language of the people. And this is why it reads the way it reads, because that's the way people spoke back then, with the these mm-hmm. and thou's and stuff like that. And um, suffer the children to come unto me, and wherefore art thou Romeo, that kind of stuff, you know. And well, she wasn't asking, where is he? She was asking, why is he Romeo, uh, etc. So the, the um, a Capulet, not a Montague, or whatever, maybe I got those two mixed up. In any event, the language is uh, very flowing and very uh, literary, attractive and beautiful to people. That's one reason they like it. But the real academic question is whether it's a good translation or not. Now, right. at the time, there was a limited number of manuscripts that were available to inform the translation of the King James Bible. Okay. Okay, um, those, those, the, those, those documents, those manuscripts... Let me back up for a second. Manuscripts come in families, okay? And what I mean okay. by that is if early on there's a certain set of variations that show up in a manuscript and there's a bunch of copies that are made from that, then the copies are going to look like that one and some other one that has different set of variants. And I'm not talking about massive differences, but there are differences you can write, you can see are going to are going to show up in the subsequent copies. So now you have two different families of manuscripts. And this family is called the majority text because there are more manuscripts of this kind of text, also known as the Byzantine text. and um, But the manuscripts are not as early as some of the other ones we have. Okay. However, they were the ones that were largely available for the translation of the King James. And this, this body of texts were called the received text that they translated the King James out of, or the Textus Receptus. Okay? Mm-hmm. Now, there is a legitimate academic discussion about whether or not the majority text, or the Textus Receptus, is the best underlying Greek manuscripts available for translating into English. Okay, mm-hmm. does, does that make sense, what I just said? Yes. Yeah, okay. So all of our English translations come from Greek texts, and the tra- there's a lot of them out there, thousands of them, and they have variations, and uh, some of the variations you know, are similar to others. There's kind of families of these texts, and some academics um, are going to go with the majority opinion. Here are the majority of texts have this support, this rendering. Mm-hmm. Um, and others are going to say, well, that is the majority, but it's also Byzantine. That means it survived longer. It's late, and so they survived. The earlier texts, a lot of them were destroyed because of persecution. We have fewer of those, but because they're earlier, we're giving our academic preference to the earlier texts, not to the majority of the text. So there's a legitimate debate about that. Okay. Right. Now, and sometimes that debate can get a little bit heated. <laughs> right? So there are some yeah. people who prefer the King James because they think the underlying Greek manuscripts are more reliable than the so-called critical text that underlies other translations like the New American Standard or other more modern translations, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, part of the rationale would be that, wait, some of these older manuscripts, even though there's fewer of them, probably give us a more accurate characterization of the original, because they're they're older and closer to the original, right? Mm -hmm. And less of an opportunity for scribes to gloss them up. Okay, mm-hmm. scribal glosses are where the scribes trying to improve on something. They think, well, they should read this way. That must be a mistake. It should read this way. And so then they put their little scribal glosses in. And it isn't like they did it a lot, but they, they have, it's pretty clear. It happens sometimes when the text, the text that they have in front of them does not represent as high a Christology in its wording as a, maybe a, another way of putting it. So they might have a variant where it says the Lord Jesus Christ rather than Jesus Christ. And they say, well, he is the Lord. And anyway, he's God. And so they're going to put Lord in there, and it, even if it's not well justified. Okay, Um, so these are just some of the things that are going on behind the scenes. Again, I don't want to overstate the shenanigans, so to speak, or the variance, because the massive text that we have is decipherable very, very well in terms of reconstruction, reconstructing the original. But there are variations that we have to make judgments on. Okay, and sometimes the judgments are a little harder than at other times. Sometimes the the gloss is really obvious. Other times it's not so obvious. So okay, so that's all background information. Some people think the underlying Greek manuscript, the Textus Receptus, the received text is actually more reliable than something like the critical text. Okay, that's a that's an academic debate. All right. Okay. That's a legitimate debate. And so there are some people who are King James only because they think that it reflects the best manuscripts that we have. Good enough. Okay. okay. Now there's a different 
variety of King James only person. And this person thinks that the King James is the only God inspired translation. Wow. They hold okay. that the King James Bible is the inspired word of God, that it is it has the same authority as an autograph, which is an original. It right. is the King James that is inspired, not the autograph that's inspired and then as accurately as possible translated into English. No, they, they think it's the King James that's inspired. Mm, okay. Now, you can see that's a very different group of people. Sure. And, um, I mean, their, their attitude is more, if it's good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for me, you know, that kind of deal, which is kind of a okay. joke. <laughs> but there is a variation of that I'll tell you about in a moment that is kind of interesting. So notice that the commitments are very different. One commitment is to the underlying Greek manuscripts, and uh-huh. the other one is commitment to the translation itself. Now, I think okay. the second one is silly. I would agree. Okay. Okay. But there's a lot of people, you can't tell that to people who hold that view. Right. Um, but what you might ask is, well, when you say the King James itself is the translation that is inspired by God, which King James version did you have in mind? Because there were multiple right. King James versions, you know. Okay. Early on, they made some changes, whatever. So that raises a question, which one? And uh, then, um, and it might be helpful to know that this debate, this, the, the, this kind of debate has happened before. Because okay. notice they went from the King James, rather, they went, they went from the Latin Vulgate, which was the received text after fashion of the mm-hmm. church. We have the Latin. We have Jerome. Put together the Latin translation. Now you want to translate it into English? King James Version? No, the Latin is what God gave us. And so that's the true inspired Bible. So, so ironically, the King James was the newcomer on the street and had a battle with the, the, with the, uh, the, 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 um, the, Vulgate. the Vulgate only crowd. Thank you. Right. Yeah. But that wasn't okay. the first time that this has happened either because there was another d- debate earlier. <laughs> Remember when I said if it's good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for us? Yes, sir. That happened with the Septuagint. Okay. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, you know this, um, mm-hmm. but th- that was used principally by the apostles in the first century. They used a translation. They didn't translate, they didn't quote all the time from the Hebrew, they quoted from the Greek, Greek. Septuagint. Okay. And so there it could properly be said if it was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for me. So there was a Septuagint only. In other words, the Septuag- Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew, had a higher priority in some people's mind than the Hebrew itself. <clears throat> Okay. So this kind of debate, the second version of the King James only controversy, has been going on for a while, and um, and it just I think it's it's unfortunate because it's it's a lot of hot air based on a false idea, and the false okay. idea is that some, a, tr- a particular translation is the true word of God itself, as opposed to the underlying documents that the uh, that the translation is translated from. Okay. So there's the lay okay. of the land on that one. I, I, there are two books that are available, both of them good, and they have almost exactly the same name. It's called the King James Translation Controversy or the King James Only Controversy. I, I can't remember which is which. One is D.A. Carson, and the other one is James White. James White. Now, I have both copies, but I think James White's, and I'm just saying, I, I, I think I liked his better. Okay. And um, it writes in a little bit more popular vein, maybe. But okay. these, both of these books are probably 30 years old, 20 or 30 years old, I, I don't know, a long time okay. ago. But they're very lucid um, and well-sourced characterizations of the details that I just offered you in summary. All right. So, are you are you running into a crowd now that uh, King James only crowd uh, that you're dealing with? And that's you also had a question about Isaiah 45. So uh, maybe we can. And that's where that's where this kind of stemmed from. Uh, we were discussing the problem of evil, um, and I was going over some things. And and the husband brings brings up uh, Isaiah 45 seven out right. of the King James version, um, which uh, I can read it to you. I mean, just it says point blank, I create evil, and this is God speaking. Yeah. And and so it stopped me right then and there. Um, and so. I've done what you've, I've already dug into this quite a bit. I've done, you know, obviously don't read a Bible verse. Never read a Bible, um, right, got it. Right. Um, so I've dug into the context of what God was doing there in the chapter. Um, I've done all that, but to me, it seems, I guess I want to get your take on this. Yeah. That it's not even within God's nature to be able to create evil. And I guess the question would, two questions would be, what do you mean by create and what do you mean by evil? Right, right. Um, yeah. So, but it doesn't even seem like it would be in God's nature to, to create a, th- a thing that's not even a thing. That's right. I listen to Alan no, I think you're, donut thing. Yes, uh, that's yeah. right. And when we go to James, it says that in him there is no darkness at all. I think it's James. He's the uh, father of all good and whatever. There are other places in the Bible that make it clear that God is all good and he's not evil. Now, I have the New American Standard in front of me, and I'll just read to you the translation here. I know some of the translations say that he's the author of evil. Here's what mine says. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating mm-hmm. calamity. I'm the Lord who does all these things. So when it, even when it translates as evil, it is, it is, it is not talking about moral evil. Right. It is, that, that would be ob, ob, things that are objectively evil. It is talking about things that are evil for people or right. unpleasant. So think of it this way. When I say that hell is a good place, people freak. Okay? <laughs> but what I'm referring to is that God made it, and therefore it's good, and it accomplishes a good purpose. It ain't fun to go there. So uh, we, there's an equivocation here. When I say good, I mean morally sound, objectively good, place where justice is accomplished. When they hear good, they think fun, enjoyable, 
vacay, you know, kind of deal. That's not the good that I mean. Right. Um, and so I think this is what it's talking about here in Isaiah chapter 45. It is talking about the unfun things that fall befall us. God is still in control there. Right. Okay, now I have a note that I wrote on the side here. Notice, by the way, he is actually speaking to Cyrus here. Yes. 45, chapter 45, verse 1. Thus says mm-hmm. the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have mm-hmm. taken by the right hand. So now he's addressing Cyrus, and he's speaking um, something about the, um, you know, I don't know all the details here, but this is in the context of this, this concept, okay? Here's what I wrote. Speaking to Cyrus, verse 1. The Persian duelist. And what God is communicating here is that he is supreme over all good and evil, um, either determining or permitting whatever comes to pass. So you don't, you, this is spoken to a man who holds a fatalistic dualism, and what mm-hmm. God is communicating to him is he is the one in control. Right. It is not communicating that God is the author of moral evil, but rather a calamity that befalls people right. that uh, might be by the Cyrus, the dualist in the evil dualistic camp. You know, that's he's correcting his worldview here. Okay. Now, um, one other thing I'll say, I got about four minutes here, uh, three minutes. Okay. One other thing I want to say about the King, I hope that helps about Isaiah 45. It does. Okay. It does. The, uh, the other thing that people point out about the King James uh, debate is they will look at newer translations and they'll say, look at, see how the King James has a high view of Jesus in our translation, and look how they've taken the deity of Christ out of your newer critical translation, right? That is actually the, the big argument of the, the resource that this couple gave to me that I've been, I've been uh, reading through. Okay, yes. so let me. Uh, I, I, I uh, front-loaded my response here a few moments ago. Remember I said how sometimes scribes will gloss things and improve things? Yes, sir. The question, when somebody says, look how these have taken out of the Word of God this high Christology, well, that's actually circular reasoning because they're presuming that the Word of God is the King James and others are pirating out important uh, references to Christ here that is high Christology. But the fact is, is that these are things that were added in by ambitious scribes and the earliest documents do not support them. So, so what the critical text is doing, those translations are doing, is restoring it to its more original form. Does that mean taking out some references? Yes. References that weren't there in the original. They weren't in the original, right. Yeah. Okay. And so that's the answer to that challenge. And it's a, okay. I, I can see how, you know, when people go through this and they lay out, look at where this is missing, this is, Westcott and Hort was trying to take away the deity of Christ. No, they were trying to restore the original from the best manuscripts. And yeah. that's why some things are changed, because you have ambitious scribes that glossed things up a bit. Okay. Okay. That makes sense? It does, and I think that's what I was thinking, is that the, the they were trying to get back to these, they were just trying to get back to the original manuscripts, as right. close as we could, as, right. to the originals is what I was... That's right, and so yeah. the, the question for your friends who raise this charge is, what what do the best manuscripts show? Do they show this particular um, variation, which sounds like a higher Christology, or do they show, as better supported in the original, this this um, variation that looks like a lower Christology? No, it's not going to be a low Christology, because the rest, all the rest of the critical text is filled with high Christology. Sure. It's sure. just some of the instances that exalt Christ may have been added by scribes, and therefore should be properly removed based on the testimony of a better manuscript in order to restore the original to its a more accurate characterization. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. I thank you so much, Greg. That helps quite a bit. And thank you for taking so much time with it. No, glad to do so, Chad. We're just right at the end of the show, so it was perfect, perfect okay. timing. Maybe I'll